Hey guys, my name is Joanna, also known as Just Another Flutist here on YouTube, and today we are doing yet another Flute Center of New York sponsored review. Every month I partner up with the Flute Center of New York, they send me some flutes to try and I review them for you guys. If you guys already know this part about my JAF code, you guys can skip on over to when the review actually starts, but for those of you who don't know, I do have a code for you guys. Here it is! J-A-F. The first perk you get with this code is free domestic shipping on your new flute from the Flute Center of New York. The second perk is an extended 10-day trial instead of the usual 7 days. The third perk is that you get an extended 18-month warranty on your new flute. And the fourth perk is that you can take up to 3 instruments out on trial at a time. Just be sure that you're actually in the market to buy a flute before you take flutes out on trial. Also note that the shipping costs will be charged up front, but when you return the flutes that are out on trial for you, that shipping cost will be refunded back to you. If you want to know how to take flutes out on trial, all you have to do is contact the Flute Center of New York staff. I'll put a link to their contact page in the info box below. You can email them, phone them. They're really, really nice. Customer service is really, really good. And I'm not just saying that because I'm their partner. Like it's, it's legit has been proven with many, many people. All you have to do when you talk to them is actually just tell them the JAF code. They will usually ask you as well if you want to use a code. So you can either just proactively tell them JAF or they can ask you. The Flute Center of New York does price match any other authorized dealer of these flutes. So you always know you're getting the best bang for your buck. Just a quick note regarding trying flutes, make sure you take off all rings and dangly jewelry that can potentially scratch scratch the flute. Never use the polishing cloth, the cleaning rod, or the swabbing cloth that comes with each new flute because they are not yours yet. Do not get your spit on something that can potentially belong to someone else. The Flute Center of New York will actually have to replace it. And lastly, a quick disclaimer, every flutist plays each flute differently, like in Harry Potter, just as the wand chooses the wizard, so the flute chooses the flutist. With these videos, I'm just trying to describe to the best of my ability how these flutes like to be played, but it is up to you to decide which flute works with you. All right, and with all that said and done, let's finally get into this review. Today we're going to be reviewing the Haynes Amadeus 570 and 670 alto flutes. A quick note about Amadeus, they are sort of like the sub brand of Haynes. So this is why you'll hear me call it the Haynes Amadeus. So it's kind of like how Sonari is like the sub brand of Powell. Before I forget, because I usually forget, let's go over the specs of these alto flutes. The Haynes Amadeus 570 features a silver plated curved and straight head joint with sterling silver riser. So the combination I got has both the curved and straight head joint. I'll talk a bit later about how the pricing works for that. Silver plated body and mechanism, pointed key arms, offset G, C foot joint. And then we have the Haynes Amadeus 670, which features silver straight and curved head joints. So these are full silver head joints. On a silver plated body and mechanism, pointed key arms, also has the offset G and the C foot joint. Just so you guys are not thrown off, when I try these flutes, you will notice that I am playing in a different key than all of my other reviews. This is because the alto flute is actually keyed in the key of G. So when you finger a C, you're actually playing the G below it. The other thing is that this flute is just in general, bigger. So the tube itself is longer, it is wider, the tone holes are huge. So as you can imagine, if everything is bigger, then it's like, how are your fingers actually going to stretch to get onto the keys? Well, you know how last time we did a review on the Jupiter 700 WD and WE? The WD had what was called assisted fingering. What we have here on alto flutes is essentially assisted fingering. Your whole left hand it's just full on extension. Your G sharp lever is over here, but on like the normal C flute, it would be all the way over here. There's no way. If you look under the keys that your fingers play up here, there's actually no tone holes underneath them. They're just straight extensions for the rest of these keys. And on the right hand, we have kind of the similar looking assisted fingering that we found on last month's flute. Another interesting thing is that the B flat thumb has a roller onto your main thumb key. If you take a look at the bottom here, you'll actually notice that the thumb key itself is also like a huge extension. Essentially, your left hand is just playing ghost keys. You'll also notice that the foot joint also features a D-sharp roller. It's the same technology that they use on the thumb keys. This one is actually way more common. My own professional flute has a D-sharp roller. Very, very useful for people with small hands because it just kind of helps you make the slides between the pinky keys 
is a little bit smoother. If you look really closely, you'll find that the foot joint keys have actually been extended towards the body. The cork underneath the pinky key is actually like right over the edge of the joint. So as you can tell, the alto flute is designed to try and make it as comfortable for the flutist as possible. In terms of actually holding the flute, it's actually not bad. It's actually pretty comfortable. It's just really thin. Thick. The other thing for me is because I'm so small, the flute itself feels really heavy. As I was doing the recordings for this video, I got so tired just from holding it up. I also noticed that my right hand needed to have like a slightly different posture than I'm used to because the tube is so big that I can actually rest my whole thumb under the tube. Usually on my C flute, my thumb is actually behind the tube, not under it. Similar to the Jupiter 700 W, D, and W, E, the curved head joint comes in two pieces. You just have to kind of finesse it until you find a comfortable position for you. It is a little bit interesting to have your left hand so close to your mouth when you use the curved head joint. The other really interesting thing, I think I found out why it's like this. If you are playing with a straight head joint, it's a lot more comfortable to have what this particular 570 has. The assisted fingering keys are actually placed at an angle. At first I didn't know why it was like that and then when I popped on the straight head joint, your hand ends up being held like this. You see how that's at an angle? So they actually designed it so that the keys would very neatly fall under your hand when you have to stretch out this far with a straight head joint. But this one, the 670 that I have here, this one has all of the assisted fingerings perfectly in line. And it's a lot more comfortable when you are playing with a curved head joint. So because your hand is all the way up here, it makes no sense for your fingers to be like over it at an angle like this. Now let's talk about the packaging that they come in. They come in identical packaging. It's just basically a huge version of what you would normally expect of a flute case. You've got your outside case. The inside is lined with this faux furry white lining. You've got your pocket on the outside with like the most giant cleaning rod ever. I don't actually think I've ever seen an alto flute cleaning rod before, which is really sad because I have played alto flute before and they didn't come with cleaning rods. We've got shoulder strap. On the inside, you will find a giant polishing cloth. And then we have here a congratulations on your purchase of an Amadeus flute. Love your sound, play Amadeus. Yes. It's actually a limited warranty card. <laughs> Whoever did the marketing here, good job. Without any further ado, let's actually play around with these flutes. We're gonna start with the 570. <laughs> So here we are back at my diagrams. I was just going to give you guys a little bit of a tour of what we're looking at just to make sure that you guys know what you are looking at. We are currently looking at the side profile of a mouth and we are pretending that we can see through their cheeks into their mouth. So that means that this is the lips, this is the teeth, and this is the tongue. Is this anatomically completely correct? No. It's not, but this is a good way for me to just demonstrate and show you guys how I feel that the air is spinning inside my mouth, how I feel that the tongue is moving inside my mouth, etc., etc. I have another diagram here that will come up later in this video. And just to very quickly explain to you guys, this is the front view of your mouth. And this is a straight head joint. This again is the front view of your mouth. This thing here, is a curved head joint. Now, we will come back to this in a bit. Back to our 570. For those of you who have watched my Hanes video, this will start to sound pretty familiar. Now, on the 570, you will feel that there is a column of air going through your mouth. So you almost feel like you have this kind of swirling pipe of air, you could say. And that column of air is happening down here. I believe for the Hanes Q1, it was like somewhere up here, but not for this alto flute. This alto flute, the column of air is quite low in your mouth. Like the other Hanes flute that I reviewed before, the higher the note that you play, the more you actually kind of want to aim the air 
this way. And your lips will be the things that redirect the air going upward. The lower you want to play, the more you actually aim the air coming out of this column of air to your top lip. And then your top lip is the one that angles it down again for you. It's very interesting. The lower you go, the more you feel the sort of buzzing sensation right here. It's actually quite common for a lot of flutes to have that happen. You feel this like buzzing sensation on the bottom of your top lip. Additionally, the higher you go, the more you will feel that you are like sending the air from further and further back inside your mouth, down from your throat, and then coming up here. This flute just feels very like low in the mouth, but also very forward because a lot of the resonance is happening out here. Because this is an alto flute, I find that, you know, normally I'm already telling you guys a lot of times to not smash the flute into your chin because you should leave some room between your bottom lip and your bottom teeth. So you want room over here. Now for this flute, because it's so big, like the flute itself is so big and it can just take so much air, I find that I actually have to just imagine that there's a marble that I'm holding between my teeth and my lips like right there. So it causes your embouchure to just kind of, your lips actually have to literally make more room. Whereas on a normal C flute, it's more that you just have to keep your lips relaxed and that will be enough room between your lips and your teeth. On the alto flute, at least on this Amadeus 570, you actually have to consciously give more room between your lips and your teeth. Interesting, right? And now for harmonics. <laughs> As long as you follow what I just described earlier about how air likes to travel through your mouth and into this particular flute, you'll be fine. All the harmonics will come out just great. But the really interesting thing is the first harmonic is actually really tricky to place. I think that just has to do with the fact that we're on a completely different instrument. And so the harmonics probably respond differently than on a normal C flute. The really interesting thing was that the fourth, fifth, and sixth harmonics came out no problem. I didn't particularly feel that they were really resistant or anything, which is a complete surprise really on an alto flute. You would think that an alto flute is not meant to play super high. I mean, unless you're like Dr. Bob and you write things that high for alto flute. In any case, if you learn to place that first harmonic really, really well, that does mean that your middle register on the alto flute is going to be really, really strong because you'll know exactly like approximately where they like to be placed. Of course, the alto flute's strong suit is in the lowest register because, you know, that's kind of what you would get in alto flute four is to be able to play super low. So now for tone color. <laughs> It's actually pretty self-explanatory and it comes very naturally. If you are thinking of a richer tone, you will automatically kind of like widen this column of air. It will widen out. These arrows are pointing outwards uh, towards the cheek. As soon as you widen that column of air, everything gets like super, super rich. Granted, because you're widening the column of air, you will feel that to maintain the dynamic that you're at, you're gonna have to put in a little bit more air. Conversely, if you want a more hollow thin tone, as soon as you think that, you will end up narrowing this column of air and it will get a lot thinner. In terms of how thin this is though, it's not actually crazy thin. If you were to play a normal Haynes C flute, your kind of like normal width of the column of air inside of your mouth would be the equivalent to doing a thin sound on this alto flute. I think this is actually why a lot of people when they first start playing the alto flute, they feel like they can't get that nice big boomy sound out of it. And it's because they're applying how they play on their normal C flute exactly onto an alto flute when that doesn't work because you are using a thinner column of air to work on a flute that is much bigger than your other one. Because we're working with bigger flutes, literally everything that you do in your mouth has to be bigger in comparison than what you do on a normal C flute. Just a quick note about getting a hollower, thinner sound on the alto flute. Sometimes you want it. A lot of composers like to use the alto flute more as like a haunting, 
kind of like very atmospheric, mysterious instrument because it's the sound of a flute, but you never think that the sound of a flute should go that low. So it's a, it is actually a little bit disconcerting to most ears. Sometimes when you're going for that haunting sound, you don't always want to have like a super rich, boomy, big sound. You know, you actually do sometimes want to have like a thin, hollow sound just to get that kind of like atmospheric quality across. Now for dynamics. <laughs> We will now be working with this portion. So make sure that you guys don't get that confused. When you are working with dynamics, make sure you're not just playing with what's going on on the inside of your mouth because that's not actually going to make your sound any louder or any softer. Remember this marble that I talked about? So all you have to do is imagine that marble getting super big for the louder notes. So the louder you play, the bigger that marble is going to be. And so conversely, the smaller you make that marble, the softer you will play. You can actually get even smaller than like a mezzo piano on a normal C flute. It's actually pretty surprising the amount of range that you get on this flute. You can get quite loud and you can get quite soft. It's actually very impressive how soft you can get on this flute. That's the really impressive part. All right, so now for articulation. <laughs> The tip of your tongue does not only touch the top front teeth, it actually also touches the top four front teeth. So it's quite wide. There you have it. That's kind of how it feels. It's not a really harsh tongue either. It's a very light tongue. You definitely aren't smashing your tongue against your teeth. It's more of like a gentle graze. So this is a T part. Now the K part of your double tonguing is really interesting. You'll bring your tongue back, but you won't particularly feel like you are actually making crazy direct contact to this part of your mouth right here. It just kind of like very lightly grazes it. And that's all you need to get a really nice clear sound. You almost feel like you're kind of fake tonguing your way through. Quick tip, make sure that you don't say kuh, because if you say kuh, you'll end up with your tongue back here. This will make your sound very swallowed and it will make your tongue pretty stiff too. So your tongue will get slower and slower and you don't want that. The mechanism is very, very smooth. <laughs> has a little bit of resistance, which I find quite helpful because this thing feels so big and unwieldy that it's nice to have a bit of resistance there just to help smooth things out if I kind of like, you know, have a spasm. I also found that the trill keys were surprisingly bouncy with a little bit of resistance. It's kind of funny because it's a little bit disconcerting how the size of the trill keys is exactly, pretty much exactly the size of the trill keys of like a normal C flute. So it looks really tiny on this gigantic alto flute. The trill key itself is actually an extension in it of itself because it's actually wiggling a key that is like way higher up on the flute, so like on the tube. So there is really no reason to make it like giant like the rest of the flute, right? Cause that'll just add more weight to the flute, which is not what you want. But it was just kind of funny. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like much smaller than I anticipated. The only thing was that I found that the higher C trill key, which sounds as a G to an A trill. The A is quite out of tune. I only think it's because I'm so used to hearing the G to A trill on a normal flute being in tune 
And then to hear it used with a trill key version on an alto flute is like a little bit surprising. So just watch out for that. In actual fact, on a C flute, when you play the high C to D trill, that D is actually really out of tune. So this is actually completely in line with how the tuning works on a C flute. It's just been transposed down, but our ears are so used to hearing the G to A normal trill that when we hear it with a trill key, it sounds really off. Now, now let's talk about the 670. <laughs> Very, very similar to the 570, except the placement of the column of air is a little bit higher. Whereas the 570 was here, it is now up here. So I'm going to make a confession here. As much as I enjoy the extra resonance that I get from the more silver content in the 670, because the 670 is the one that has a full silver head joint. I really enjoy the resonance and the, the dark colors and the, uh, like it just is a little bit more boomy, you could say, than the 570. As much as I like that, playing like this does not work with my mouth. It is very unfortunate. What you are hearing when I am doing these demos for you guys is me literally like forcing myself to play like this in order for it to sound really good. Now, other than that, everything else works exactly the same. So the higher you play, the more you aim the air going here, right? And the lower you play, the more you aim your air here. And again, you feel that buzzing sensation right there. As for harmonics, <laughs> The first harmonic responds very, very well. It's the second harmonic that is sometimes hard to place. I wonder if it's because your column of air is higher in your mouth. In terms of aiming where the air should be, it does kind of offset it a little bit from the 570. It's definitely easier to target than the first harmonic on the 570, but it's still not quite where you would expect it to be placed compared to a normal C flute. Otherwise, everything else comes out extremely, extremely responsively. Again, the top harmonics home out no problem. You can get the sixth harmonic no problem, almost no resistance to it whatsoever. I just can't get the seventh harmonic out at all on either the 570 or the 670, but honestly, no one wants to hear notes that high on an alto flute, unless again, you are Dr. Bob. Tone color on this guy, same thing as the 570. It's just that your column of air is higher in your mouth. So if you are not used to that feeling, this may be a little bit off-putting to you. But at the same time, if you are not used to your column of air being so low in your mouth as on the 570, you might not like that either. So you can see how this is really a question of preference. My mouth prefers the 570 over the 670 simply because of the placement of this column of air. The more resonant you wanna be, the wider you make this column of air. The more hollow and thin you want your sound to be, the more you thin out this column of air, you narrow it down. Now let's do some dynamics. Same idea as on the 570. You have this marble. I do notice that this marble is a little bit higher up. It's placed a little higher up than on the 570. It's more pronounced when you play around with dynamics. I guess maybe this marble needs to be in line with this column of air. Because the column of air is higher, your marble also needs to be higher. So this means that when you feel this area in your mouth kind of like resonating and vibrating, you actually feel it more in your top lip than you do in your bottom lip. You still feel it a little bit in your bottom lip, but mostly in your top lip. The louder you wanna be, the bigger you make that marble. The softer you wanna be, 
the smaller you make that marble. And again, it just has to be a tiny bit higher than on the 570. Now for articulation. <laughs> As you can imagine, because your column of air is higher, that will also slightly change the placement of your tongue. But in terms of how your tongue feels, it feels exactly the same as the 570. Where does your tongue go? I think this part is kind of obvious. It goes a little higher. Your tongue before was down here. Now it's like up here. Again, it's just because your column of air is now up here instead of down here. Otherwise, the feeling is the same. The tip of your tongue is a lot blunter. It can spread out a little bit more. And also when you double tongue and you do the ke, again, it doesn't actually make complete contact with the back of your mouth here. It just grazes it barely. So again, it does kind of feel like you are cheating double tonguing. It doesn't actually really feel like a true double tongue. <laughs> actually is pretty much exactly the same, except that the right hand assisted fingering keys are at a slightly different angle. So here's the bonus part that I wanted to include. This actually applies to both the 570 and the 670, but it is more pronounced on the 670. On the normal straight head that we have here, if you've been playing the flute for a while and then you go to play an alto flute, you kind of expect that because the flute is so big, you're going to hear the sound coming to you from a little bit further away. On the straight head joint, I'm just gonna draw here what I hear. I feel like the source of sound is coming from like down here. But on the curved head joint, you feel like the source of sound is like in your face. It's very different acoustically around you. I'm just going to bet that all alto flutes probably feel like this. I did an alto flute project with my theory professor, Dr. Bob. And in that one, I used a straight head joint, even though I really should have used the curved head joint. I'm a small person, so the curved head joint is just a lot more comfortable for me. But the only alto flute that he could get his hands on was a straight head alto flute. At that point, I actually didn't know that there was this acoustic difference between a curved head joint and a straight head joint. And I discovered it this time playing with these flutes. I think when you guys hear the straight head versus the curved head, I don't actually think you guys can really hear a difference. <laughs> This is more of like, if you are the person playing the instrument, then you can tell. Instead of focusing so much on what's going on on the right side of your ear, you're gonna have to start to focus on what's happening like in front of your nose. As long as you make that shift, you'll be fine. A lot of people will say, well, I mean, when you play the flute, like, don't you actually hear it up here? You do, but when you, play a curved head joint, you feel it and hear it even more. Like you can almost feel the vibrations even more in front of you than on a straight head. For those of you who have played curved head joints on your student model flutes, this may not be a new thing to you at all. However, it was a new thing to me because I never played a curved head joint flute growing up. Let's now talk about the price of these flutes. We're going to start with the 570. The base price of this, if you only got it with the straight head joint, is $1,990. If you got the curved head joint only, it is actually an additional $70. So that would come out to $2,060. However, if you wanted both head joints, if you wanted both the straight and the curved head joints, then that would 
cost an additional $190 to the base price. So that would come out to $2,180, which is what I have here. Next, we have the 670. The base price of the 670 is $2,890. And this is mostly due to the fact that the head joint itself is actually completely silver. If you wanted the curved head joint only, that is an additional $80. So that would come out to $2,970. If you wanted both the straight and the curved head joint, then you would be looking at an additional $470 because of all that silver, right? If you add that onto the base price, it will come out to a grand total of $3,360. These prices for these Alto flutes are really good, especially because they are new. All right, and there you have it. That is my review of the Hanes Amadeus 570 and 670 Alto flutes. They are really, really, really beautiful. To be 100% honest, uh, this, I have never actually really truly played a new alto flute before. I've just, you know, kind of did a few blips here and there at, you know, festivals here and there. But in terms of legitimately playing around with an alto flute, I've only ever played around with like really beat up old used ones. So it was such a pleasure to play around with new ones. Like, Honey, I feel really spoiled. Let us know in the comments below if you enjoyed this review and what other flutes you would like to see next. Not only do I read the comments, but the Flute Center of New York reads them as well. Be sure to follow the Flute Center of New York on their Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'll put a link to their social media in the info box down below. And as usual, if you guys like this video, make sure you give me a big thumbs up and hit subscribe for new videos every Saturday. My last video is over there. And if you want to catch me during the week, my social media networks are down there. But otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Bye. So a lot of you guys have been asking me to review alto flutes for a long time now and I have finally caved. I feel like now we have built this nice broad selection of flutes that we have reviewed so we can start putting in some fun stuff like this.